Welcome to Speed Talk Live, which isn't really live, but is a poorly produced podcast featuring me and my big mouth rattling off, sometimes incoherently, about racing and sometimes featuring what we hope are interesting guests. I'm Greg Engel. Let's get this party started. Well, welcome back, everybody. It's good to have you here on Speed Talk Live. I'm Greg Engel. Thanks for downloading. Thanks for clicking the play button. I know I certainly appreciate it. So we're coming out of Atlanta, and let's talk about the elephant in the room. You know, the track was reconfigured in 2022. The banking was raised. The groove was lessened. And, of course, the track repaved. Still considered an intermediate track, but it races like a super speedway. And boy, howdy, did it deliver on Sunday. We had great racing throughout. Austin Sindrick at one point made a four-wide pass for the lead, which was incredible. But it all came down to the last lap. And there was only four cars that actually had no damage from any sort of incident. So they had a lot of crashes. And it was a lot going on. But it had a three-wide finish there at the end. The closest finish in Atlanta history. But it had a three-wide finish there at the end. The closest finish in Atlanta history. Zero, zero, three hundredths of a second. And who should come out on top? None other than Daniel Suarez. Yeah, it was... Uh... It was definitely a special moment. Um, you know, going back actually to the research, um, I have to thank actually Cal Bush because he, he did a, a very, very good job giving me some good pushes. Uh, to take the lead the first time uh, when I was third, and uh, we took the lead together. And, uh, and then after that, when I picked the bottom in front of him, uh, it worked out good, but uh, but the, the 12 car, the Penske car, they were pretty strong. They were pretty strong, especially when they were close to being together. And uh, and the, the outside line on the back of straightaway came extremely strong, way sooner than what I was anticipating. And uh, and the, the 12 was able to push me, but when he moved me a little bit, he was able to get to my outside. And that's exactly what I didn't want. It. I didn't want to give him my outside, but uh, at that point I was racing in second and I was trying to figure out how to get to him. Uh, I almost got to him, uh, getting into a tree, but I got very, very loose, and, and I couldn't actually get there. And when we crossed the white flag, I knew we were going to have a good shot because the two car was behind me, and he was giving me very, very good pushes. And, and I, I dragged the brake a little bit uh, on corner two, and, uh, and I, I, I can see him coming with a push. I say, okay, here he comes, and my, my move was going to come after that. But then he slowed down, and, uh, and I was like, damn it. <laughs> like, obviously, he didn't want to help me because his teammate was, was on the lead. But at that point, the 23 pushed the, the 8, and the 8 was able to make the move, and I was able to side drive the 8, and that's when the 3 white, you know, got uh, started. So it was a little crazy. Um, you know, who knows what, what would have happened if the 2 was actually giving me the push. Maybe, who knows, maybe they were going to pass me back, get X04. I'm just I'm just glad we're here uh, with uh, with my entire team, Dry House, Chevrolet, Freeway Insurance, Cesar over there, CEO of Freeway Insurance with his entire family. He's been in Victory Lane already twice in one month, so so he he's getting a spoil, and uh, and yeah, just very happy, you know, very happy. Uh, everyone in Dry House uh, work extremely hard in the off season, and to be able to to start the 2024 season this is strong because last last weekend the Daytona 500 we finished. 30 second or something like that, but we were running up front and we wrecked r running up front. And, uh, and I felt like we have a strong team and, uh, and we're showing that uh, so far in the couple of weeks that we've been racing. So uh, we have to continue to build on that. Racing, racing. I love the way Daniel Suarez says anything. Of course, anytime somebody speaks English with a Spanish accent, I think it's pretty hot myself. Hey, and when the TV ratings came out on Tuesday, the race was up 5% over last year at the same time, which last year was the Fontana race, the last one. And it was the most watched sports program of the weekend in the U.S. So was it a winner? I think so. All right, let's get the take on it now from, for Atlanta from our very own guy, our associate editor for CupScene.com, Owen Johnson. Hello, my friend. How are you? Hello, Greg. I'm doing great. How about you? Good. Now, I want to get the backstory before we, we dive into to all the racing stuff, because you're not on the sunny shores of America. You are in England, specifically in the London area. Tell everybody what you're doing, where you're at, and, and why you're there. 
It is definitely not sunny shores over here all the time, I can tell you that. I am at law school. I am at University College London studying law, and I am continuing to write for Cupscene. We're and associate editor and watch NASCAR over here. I was going to ask you that. You know, when you look at, at uh, you know, NASCAR in Europe, you, you don't have the probably the same access as we do. What's it like to 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 watch a race, a NASCAR race, when you're in England? What's that like? There's a couple different ways to do it. There's you can go through one of the, I think they call it um, Surfshark, one of the VPNs. And then you can also go through some of the more legitimate means. And so, the, <laughs> you, <laughs> and so those more legitimate means, you're definitely right, have some less, have less coverage. I think they only do cup for the most part. So, so it's definitely you, a lot less. Do you, do you get like, do, do you get any network coverage at all? Or you have to, you have to depend on your, your less than uh, above board <laughs> means? There's network coverage, but it's on, it's on some specific sport channels. Yes. Okay. Did, have you have you been out to like a pub or anything? I mean, I know you're you're young you're a young lad. You're working hard in law school, which, by the way, I'm very very proud and very happy for you. Um, have you been out, or do you, do you just kind of like stick in your dorm room, or or have you been out among a crowd to watch? I've absolutely been out to watch some sports. I have to say, NASCAR has never been on. I, I've yet to I've yet to convince the Englishman that NASCAR is the way. So, uh, some Formula One. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm going to give you an assignment. Between now and the next time we talk, you are to go to a pub and you are to tell them that you want to watch NASCAR because I, I, I'm curious to see how the English fans would, would look at it. Because there's supposed to be a rabid fan base over there, and I'm sure there is. But um, So that's your assignment. And Absolutely. I know I know from experience that when I ask you to do something, um, you don't say no. So uh, don't get yourself in trouble, okay? Just, just don't get yourself in trouble. <laughs> But but yeah, go to a pub and and let's see what the what the uh, reactions are the next the next Na next NASCAR race it was on, and you know what I should have given you this before Atlanta because what about Atlanta? What did you think of that race and the finish? That was absolutely crazy. I think the next gen has put on some absolutely incredible shows this past these past couple of years. I think the next gen has brought more viral moments than any car, and I think at this point that's what any sport needs to stay relevant especially a sport that at the end of the day is losing a significant portion of older viewers. It needs some viral moments and to have Chastain's wall ride, for instance, coupled with that amazing Atlanta finish that new fans can latch onto and get interested from. I think that's really good for the sport. I think that it almost rises to the level. And I just thought of this today. I think it almost rises to the level and you may not remember this, but in, in 1979, the first Daytona 500 that was broadcast live, when the Allison brothers and Cale Yarbrough got in a fight on the backstretch. And that kind of helped sear NASCAR into people's brains. The more the week goes on, they're still showing this finish. I wonder if this is going to be that kind of moment or if it's just going to be another great finish among great finishes. Um, and whether it's going to be just this moment we're going to look back on years from now and say this is the resurgence of NASCAR. I don't know. And I don't know if you know what I'm talking about with the 1979 Daytona 500, but that really, that was the first flag to flag coverage and people yeah. were stuck in with a snowstorm and, and the, the, you know, we had the fight on the backstretch, but I, I kind of think I'm, and, and I'm wondering if that's what it's going to be in the, in the future, but we'll see. Yeah, I definitely know what you're talking about. I, I certainly hope so. I think the one thing that gives me a little bit of pause is the fact that Chastain's wall ride, which obviously isn't a fit, isn't a photo finish so much. Maybe it doesn't appeal to the racing fan as much, but still. For as much coverage as it got, I don't think it brought too many new fans into the sport. So we'll see. We'll see how much this did. That's, that's hopefully. Fair, yeah, that's a fair assumption. I know the, the the TV ratings were up five percent over the same time last year, which was mm -hmm. um, the the last race at Fontana, wipe a tear. Um, but yeah, so yeah, you. I agree. You're right. Um, we'll see how that that plays out. So let me ask you this. Speaking of old things, uh, um, I talked to Ray Evernham. And, and and it's really weird because we got the generational gap, right? I can remember when Ray Evernham and Jeff Gordon were new people coming into the sport. And now you've never seen Ray Evernham crew chief. Maybe you've seen him do the, I know you've seen him do the SRX stuff because you covered that when it was going. Um, do you have any memories beyond that of, of Ray Evernham? I've seen him a couple times on the TV broadcast, brought in as some sort of analyst. And I, I know I, I, the closest connection I've got is the SRX series, which, like you said, we covered 
until it's now it's been suspended this year but hopefully we get that going because i i absolutely love that racing and he put on a good show making those cars so i know i know he's a great car builder from the srx series but that's about all i've got well he started out in iraq actually as he started out as a racer in new jersey um and and he's got this book out now uh, and that's the reason i talked to him but he started as a racer in new jersey um couldn't really make it there so he he went to and, and was a mechanic in the IROC series and worked his way up. And, you know, you mentioned the SRX series because I know you and I were both into that, and you did some great coverage mm -hmm. for that. And then abruptly they stopped, and I didn't really understand it. And while I didn't uh, want to open that wound, so to speak, because, you know, I don't, I don't need to – we don't need to dig down into that, I actually asked Ray about that. He talked about the reasons behind the SRX series and gave some hints as to may, maybe why it went away and what the future was. So I'll tell you what. Let's take a break here and let's watch the interview I did with Ray Evernham, Hall of Fame NASCAR crew chief, three-time champion with Jeff Gordon, and we'll be right back. All right, we're talking to Ray Evernham, and of course, if you've been around the sport any length of time, you know who Ray Evernham is. Uh, I will not dawdle on all the accomplishments he's had in NASCAR Hall of Fame crew chief, uh, three titles with Jeff Gordon, and but that's not, he, he hasn't just done NASCAR, he's done a lot. Uh, a, a lot in the sport, a lot in motorsports. Ray, thanks for taking some time out to spend a few minutes with us today, and welcome, my friend. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me on. So you've got a book coming out, and that's why we're talking. Uh, I am not a big book reader, but of course, I'll have a copy. I'll read it. I'm well, it's looking coming on audio, too, so you just <laughs> listen to it. There you go. Well, let me ask you a question, though. Of everything you've got going on, what was the motivation for this book, to do this book? I mean, why now? Um, I've been racing. Uh, it'll be 50 years next year. Uh, and I feel like been very fortunate, the uh, Forrest Gump of motorsports, if you will, to have crossed paths with large parts of, of our history. And along the way, I've had a lot of help from a lot of people um, that didn't get to make the journey with me. And I wanted to tell my story, tell the path that I've taken, and let those people know that, hey, that they came for this ride with me, and that everyone you meet along the way is important, and that you continue to evolve. And I wanted the people close to me, you know, my, my children, um, my family, to understand exactly what I was thinking in those times, and, and how, looking back on it, and maybe they'll understand, maybe they won't, but... I felt like we 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 have a, a good story to tell historically. Uh, again, I've been very fortunate to have worked with some of the greats of all time in motorsport. Mm -hmm. Jeff Gordon and I certainly have some great stories, and Mr. Hendrick and and, and that group. So entertaining as as well as educational, because I've tried to tie them back to a business or a life lesson that helped me evolve into the person that I was. But and quite honestly, largely directed because. Years from now, I hope that my children and grandchildren, I want them to know, hey, what what the heck was dad thinking? <laughs> we could probably spend all day talking <clears throat> the different stories and the different things you go around. But, but what are some of the highlights or maybe some of the stories we haven't heard that stand out to you in this book? Well, we, we, uh, we talk about my, my early beginnings at, you know, in New Jersey and how I really never wanted to do anything but but race cars. And I was lucky enough to have an uncle and a, a friend that that got me going on it. My my dad was a semi-pro athlete. My dad was a fantastic athlete. So, you know, I was certainly a big disappointment to him when I was like, yeah, I don't really like that football and baseball stuff. I want to drive cars, you know? And uh, so growing up uh, and being in, in New Jersey was fortunate enough to be around a lot of great local stars. And then Roger Penske and Jay Signore moved the International Race of Champions right into Tinton Falls, New Jersey, and certainly got me my big break. But it, you know, it's called trophies and scars because it's, you know, it's not always easy. You know, I've got plenty of trophies, but I also got plenty of scars from from getting those trophies or from the trophies that I didn't get. So I think people will find that I'm open and honest about um, my upbringing and the fact that I probably didn't put enough effort into my own driving career early, you know, a little bit too much uh, partying at the Jersey Shore. And then, uh, you know, we're honest about, you know, the, the change is going to to Hendrick, you know, Ray J's battle with leukemia, uh, you know, some of the some of the controversies Jeff and I got in, you know, we tell the, the story behind that. And, you know, then as well as uh, 
how the Dodge program came about and then, you know, divorce and, and everything else that uh, I think there's a lot of things in there that people who are not professional racers face. You know, you, you talked about uh, when Dodge came in the sport and you spearheaded that, you know, when you when you're in NASCAR and you're working full time and you've got that hard card hanging around your neck and that's how you, you make your living. There's kind of like almost like like boundaries, so to speak, like fence lines, right, that you can't. You can't criticize NASCAR too much or you're going to get the phone call or you, you have some of these boundaries it, within that realm. When, when you talk about Dodge coming into the sport, because I remember that very well, how hard was it to collaborate with NASCAR um, when, when something like that came down the pike, like Dodge wanting to come into NASCAR? How hard it was it to collaborate with with the executives in, in NASCAR? It was really easy to, to collaborate with with, the, with NASCAR at that point because, uh, you know, another manufacturer is coming into the sport, which is great. And so NASCAR worked. We worked hand in hand through that whole process on developing the car, developing the motor. Uh, you know, and again, we get it. You know, you say boundaries. We say, hey, stay in your lane. I'll stay in my lane kind of thing. That's that's kind of racing terminology. Right. But, you know, truthfully, uh, you know, they wanted to make sure they guided us to so that we didn't have a problem when we we showed up and step by step whether it was developing the body or developing the motor or doing the testing nascar was honestly a pleasure to work with uh, through that stuff now when i say that the pleasure from my side development side you know from my competitive side i was always trying to get a little bit of an edge and you know they were really clear about not letting that happen and dodge uh when we developed the, the first the Dodge Intrepid to come back in 2001, it really started that common template thing because they were like, look, you know, the first car we built was a bit of a Batmobile. <laughs> and they were like, come on, Ray. You know? And so they said, Let, let's come up with a common template so we didn't have manufacturers fighting. But, you know, all in all that, you know, NASCAR, NASCAR was a pleasure to work with on that project. Why do you think that Dodge left ultimately? can't answer that you know that's something that the dodge you know i have to be able to think what they're thinking i don't know why you know from my standpoint you know if you're going to sell cars in america you need to be involved in in nascar i think that there's some foreign car manufacturers now that are that are starting to look at it so i really can't answer um why dodge would want to uh, leave I'm, I'm glad that roger penske and his team were able to bring them a championship you know before they left yep. but that that'd be a question for somebody at dodge marketing you know, NASCAR, speaking of the OEMs, NASCAR has been saying for years they want a new OEM, um, and Dodge was the last one, uh, and, and then Toyota, of course. But what do you think is taking so long for a new OEM to come into this sport? Just in your opinion. I, I know you may not have the inside knowledge. Um, well, I, I, honestly, I think that those the barriers that were stopping them from coming in have gone away now. And as they get closer and closer to coming up with a common engine, I think that's even going to make it easier. Um, so I, I think this new car, uh, you know, the, the Gen 7 car uh, has been a savior towards bringing new owners in, new companies, because you can take the book that you had for 100 years that, you know, guys like Rick Hendrick and Richard Childress, Roger Penske, you know, Jack, Jack Roush have spent hundreds of millions of dollars gathering that information that went out the window with that, with the new car. And the, the new car is, uh, you know, the, the, everybody's got the same car, right? So, but you know, it, as like with indie car racing and things like that, I think that, that, that homolog how, yeah, homologation of the cars really helped indie car racing as I think it's helping NASCAR. So the barriers for a, a new manufacturer or a new owner are certainly getting smaller. And I think as you see the engine stuff coming closer and closer, you'll find out that um, you'll see some of those uh, other manufacturers that have been really just dipping their toe in the water or, or standing by the edge of the shore there, jump in. Yeah, I'll tell you this. I think just, just from what I'm looking at and what I see, I think Honda is going to be the next one. Do you, do you think that the, there's somebody that, that you would, if you had to choose, that you would think would come in uh, next? Well, if you look at it, you know, all around the world, you know, they're, they're, whether it's in Australia or Germany, you know, it's not just guys that are in Formula One and IndyCar. You know, there's a lot of touring car guys, you know, I'm, you know BMW, Mercedes, you, you know, you know I, I think that any of those those people would jump in. I mean, Honda, obviously, for sure, they've got a, you know, a great performance record. But if you you look at the type of car that we're racing now 
and some of the manufacturers around the world that are involved in in, in what I call it, you know, touring car events, whether that's in Australia or, or in Germany or uh, wherever. I think it, it as they get, you know, as they get closer and closer to getting the engine rules kind of a common engine, I, I believe you'll see some of those manufacturers jump in. Now, I don't want to I don't want to dive too deep into into this because I want to talk SRX. But I know there's a lot of stuff that went on behind the scenes. I I don't want to dig up all that dirt. I'm not trying to look for some kind of expose. It happened. It's done. So what's done is done. But I think it showed that that a weeknight kind of presentation like that will work. Do you see yourself, because you've got the IROC jacket on, um, I love IROC, and I'm not saying that you'll bring IROC back, but could that be kind of the catalyst for something to, to maybe – reinvent something where we could have some weeknight racing like we have with SRX again? Um, I don't know. You know, you know, the, the SRX thing, you know, it's, it, it still didn't rate the way that it needed to on the weeknight. Everybody thought it was a great idea, but you know, you've got to, you know, to, to, to raise the kind of money that it takes to, to, to do a program like that, it's got to have a, a pretty big viewing audience. Um, so I, I do believe that there is a spot, a place for a form of motorsports entertainment like that. You know what the actual TV formula is? Not sure, but but again, it is there. There is absolutely one hundred percent, I think, a place for motor that form of motorsports entertainment. Um, but you know, TV is a tough business because you just don't know when people want to watch, what they want to watch, how long they want to watch. Uh, you know, I I felt like on Saturday nights when we were uh, the, the the CBS show on Saturday nights. You know, that was about a million, three million, four viewers uh, every year. And I felt like we could have maybe got that up. So not sure that was uh, that that was a bad night. You know, again, on, on, on a Wednesday or Thursday night, I just don't know how many people are are going to watch, uh, you know, a, a two hour show, especially when when you've got that East Coast versus West Coast yeah. and, and all those things. So, you know, TV is a tricky business. Jill, so what are we going to see with IROC, you think? I mean, how would you like how would you envision IROC, is it going to be a museum piece, just pieces, or, or are we going to ever see something on track, you think? Well, you'll see stuff on track to begin, to begin with. it. We're going to try and get as many. We want to have an IROC reunion, right, and find out where all these IROC cars are. You know, there's been a really, uh, uh, you know, an overwhelming almost interest in the brand. But mm -hmm. what is that? Is that enough people to support running a series? Don't know. You know, that's kind of where we're, we're in the early stages right now. Uh got the brands the marks we're bringing that back we're going to put an irock reunion together put some vintage cars on tracks do some do some races some exhibitions and just see where it goes you know ultimately an irock series you know like it was in the 70s 80s fantastic but the world has changed so uh, you know it may have to be a different version of that but certainly again got to work hand in hand with with the big you know the big guys you know whether that's nascar or indycar or Formula One, you know, it can really be a, a great support program to any of those um, drivers. It's just like I started, when I started SRX, that was the plan. Be support to NASCAR, be support to IndyCar, take the guys that have retired early, bring them back, you know, put some current guys in there and make it a form of, of motorsports entertainment. You know, when you take the competition out, you know, uh, where, uh, it, it just takes a little bit of that stress away and let the competition between the drivers have, you know, let the drivers have fun amongst themselves and let us worry about the rest of the stuff. So hopefully we could do that, uh, you know, again with IROC, but right now the main focus is, is gathering an IROC reunion with cars and drivers and fans and all the people that have IROC Z Camaros and things like that. I, I I'm, I'm excited to see what, what that future holds no matter what you do with it. But you know, you and I, we've been we've been around here. You've been around here longer than I have, but but we've seen a lot happen in this sport, in NASCAR, in the especially in the last few years. How has the sport, in your opinion, changed since you since you really began? I think it's changed just like every other sport, right? It goes through cycles, and you know the money has has come in and the value and and, and TV. I'm sure that when you if you played baseball or football you know in, in the early 60s and 70s it's much different than it is today you know the way it's regulated the way it it, it has to be run you know tv uh, and money drive a a big part of that uh, I, I think technology uh, has probably 
determine more of direction that we go in. Mm -hmm. I, I say to everybody, you know, it's not so much what we're doing, it's the tools, the tools that have developed for us to do what we do are incredible. And and they, they've got, you know, the way we measure stuff, the way we build stuff, at the speed we build it, and the accuracy we built it, it brings that competition closer and closer, but it also it also raises the price of of playing the game. And and uh, you know, I, I hope that either the machine will always be part of it. But I hope in the end that you know the winner or loser is still determined by the by the human being by that by the the talent of the people that either built the car, calling the race or sitting in that seat driving the car. And you know, you, we talk about the future because this sport is growing exponentially. Um, there's a lot of good things. Atlanta was an amazing race. What about the future when it comes to the way these machines are put? Uh, the way these machines are powered. I mean, everybody's talking about hybrid and electrification and different things. And I know I'm an old gearhead and I, I completely resisted you know, the first time I saw a hybrid, I, I, you know, I wanted to burn a Prius to the ground, but, but now it's, it's really become a lot more mainstream. You know, do, do you see NASCAR's future with electrification and hybrids and, and maybe, you know, not too long in the future, we'll see a hybrid race car on the track. I think what the, you know, it's not just NASCAR, whether, again, you know, Formula One, IndyCar, they've got to go wherever their manufacturers are going to go, right? So where the manufacturers go is where, where NASCAR's got to go because, it, we, you know, we talked about how important the, the the manufacturers are to racing, and that's that's all racing, right? No matter where you look, without the manufacturer's support, you really not, you know, you, you know, it just doesn't seem to have a successful business plan. So I think really keeping a close eye on where the manufacturers are going, but, you know, absolutely. NASCAR's already got an electric car, right? They, 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 they've tested it. You know, people are using forms of hybrid everywhere. So as the manufacturers start to move in that direction, I absolutely think you're going to see more and more of that on track. Let me, let me finish with this. Um, if you could, and, and the France family said, here you go. And you could run NASCAR for a day. What's one thing you would change? Oh, wow. You know, um, it's easier for me to tell you what I wouldn't change. Right? <laughs> so, uh, what I wouldn't change is the direction that they've they've taken in safety, uh, the safety of the cars and, you know, the things that they've done there. Really applaud them for, um, since we lost Dale Earnhardt in 2001, NASCAR's probably become the safest form of racing on the planet. Yep. Uh, and, it, 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 you know, that part of it is amazing. They take that very seriously. But, you know, if you said to me, all right, what do you really want to change? You know, I'm going to answer your question and say, look, I would look at taking some of this technology that's so great and all of these, these all this super technology and tools that we have and try and figure out a way to stop these big multi-car wrecks because of the pushing and the blocking that goes on. You know, maybe there's sensors on the cars that slow it down. or speed. I don't know. Um, I, I don't. I like racing. And and I don't really care to see 14 or 15 of my potential winning drivers taken out because somebody makes a push at the wrong time or somebody makes a block. You know, um, that's probably the part of the newest style of racing I don't enjoy. Ray, I, I appreciate your time. I know you'll be at Amelia this weekend celebrating with the Hendrick, Hendrick Rump Bunch. The book, Trophies and Scars. We will right. have we will have links in the comments on this podcast. We'll also have uh, we'll have links on cupscene.com. Go buy the book. Uh, I can guarantee you it's well worth it. You're a wealth of knowledge, my friend. I certainly do appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Ray Evernham, ladies and gentlemen. Why you little maggot? You make me want to vomit. Okay, it's time for this week's rants. So we had a great race at Atlanta, closest finished in Atlanta history. One of the best races I know I've seen in years, yet there were still people complaining. Now, Jeff Gluck, who runs a poll after every race, that did his yes or you know, was, the, was it a great race? And yes and no. And Atlanta only got 94 point something percent, which means 6% of those responding didn't like it. Well, you didn't watch it, right? You were watching something else. I think 60 Minutes was on or something. Because you certainly weren't watching that Atlanta race. I'm telling you, that was one of the best races Atlanta's ever had, NASCAR's ever had. Some people were trying to say that the 2001 finish was better. But 
if you think back to the 20, 2001 spring race, the reason that stands out, that, that came at a pivotal moment in NASCAR history. Dale Earnhardt Sr. had just been killed a few weeks ago at, da at Daytona. Kevin Harvick, then a young kid, had been thrust into that seat. They brought the car to Rockingham. Then they brought it to, to Atlanta. Harvick won inches over Jeff Gordon. And if you remember, or if you weren't around, Earnhardt and, and Gordon were rivals. And so it was a big deal for them to win. I remember seeing Chocolate Meyer standing in. Uh, Chocolate Myers being the gas man for Dale Earnhardt Sr., big, huge guy. I remember seeing him in victory lane or in, in the on, in, in pit lane crying. A lot of us were, uh, and Kevin Harvick, obviously, with the iconic picture of him holding the three fingers out the window in tribute to Dale Earnhardt Sr. So that was definitely a memorable one. Uh, and the one Sunday is definitely going to be a memorable one, too. We're going to be looking back at that for, for years. Now, there was a lot of cl crashes, that's true, but I think that's a product of that track, and, and that just shows how edgy these drivers are there. They're pushing it to the absolute 110% limit, they're pushing that envelope till it's about ready to break, and sometimes they go through it, and that's what happened. We had a record number of lead changes in Atlanta, boys and girls, a record number of lead changes. That race was incredible. And I think some of the some of the people that are complaining what some of the old days of racing where we had boring single line racing and people who would drivers who would win races by multiple laps ahead of the rest of the field. Um, I don't want to see that return. I don't want to see that at all. I hope that Atlanta races like that continue. I hope that we don't have as many crashes. Uh, I think that would have been that's the only sore spot to me because that cost the teams a lot of money and i hate to see that beyond that great race great winner and i was glad to glad the the race was on there it it it, it had such uh, a viral uh feel to it it went a lot of people were talking about it outside of the sport a lot of sports places were talking about it got a lot of coverage and it was nothing but good for nascar there there's my rant about Atlanta and those of you that don't like it. So let's talk about YouTube creators using race footage. So if you if you are watching the video version of this, you'll notice that you get to, you don't see anything but my ugly mug and some press conferences and some pictures that I can get that I'm allowed to use. NASCAR without a license will not let me or some, allegedly any YouTube creators use actual race footage. I can't show you the end of a race. I can show you a picture, but I can't use footage from in, in a race. I can't use the post-race interviews standing on the finish line, nothing like that. Yet I see several of these creators out there uh, using these, you know, in-race reports. I don't like that. It upsets me because A, I'm not allowed to use it, and B, um, you know, NASCAR needs to be cracking down on that. I talked to somebody at NASCAR last week, and I'm not tattling on anybody. I didn't say, hey, this guy or this guy. I asked them about it, and they said there's there's only one licensee that's allowed to do uh, use in-race footage um, from the track, from the, from the TV broadcast. Uh, beyond that, they try to crack down on it as much as they can. And I have seen some crackdowns, and I hope... I hope that they continue that and we don't see that, or they just let me use the in-race footage so I can show you guys some highlights, but can't do it for now, um, but it's available. You'll see it. It's all out there. I do get the press conferences, the post-race, the pre-race, um, and I put those out there for you. That's what mainly this channel is centered around, and that's where I get the stuff from. So, uh, you know, YouTube creators doing that to me is is nothing more than clickbait. Uh, I also I've also seen some other people who have started podcasts uh, and videos that center around videos that uh, I don't know how much cred they have. They they may go to one race a year um, and and that's it. And and then they sit and talk about NASCAR. Some of them are good. Uh, other ones I don't care for. But speaking of clickbait, quit trying to create controversy for the sake of clicks. I have seen some media people that do that. There's one in particular who writes for Yahoo Sports. Uh, and I and I get it. 
NASCAR needs to have critics. It's necessary to have critics. But come on, he was trying this past week to say that he hated the uh, the Atlanta race. He said, quote, this version of Atlanta is a horrid attempt at a real-life imitation of a NASCAR video game. Are you serious? You really can't back it up any more than that? It's a video game? No, that's what NASCAR wants. That's what NASCAR has been trying to get to. That's what the, the, the fans expect. That's what the teams know they're in for. Atlanta was a great race. When I see stuff like that, it makes me think that all you're trying to do is mirror those sites out there, and you know who you're talking about. There's sites out there run by bots that take NASCAR news and make it sensationalize it just for the sake of clicks. They don't care about the news. They don't care about the uh, they don't they, they don't care about getting the actual news out there. They just want you to click so they can serve their ads and make their ad revenue. And there's a couple out there that are like that, and it's horrible. They're they're taking content from other people and twisting it and sensationalizing it. And I find that this some some of the stuff that's a little closer to home when you get quotes like that is a little clickbait. Okay, maybe a lot of clickbait, but I get it. That's what we have to do to appease our editors. But let's face it. Let's not write stuff just for the sake of clicks. I mean, let's not sensationalize stuff that doesn't happen. Atlanta was a great race. It was a good race. Now we're going to move on because my last rant has to do with Vegas. We're going to have cliches coming out the yin-yang this, this, this week as we go into Vegas. It happens every time. We have to endure them in the spring race and in the fall race. We're going to hear Elvis singing Viva Las Vegas. We're going to hear slot machines. We're going to hear that they're rolling the dice. They're going to bet all in. And frankly, it just irritates me to no end. It may not irritate you. And I hope it's a great race, but get rid of the cliches. We don't need to be talking about Vegas like that. Please, for the love of God, stop. And that's my rants for the week. All right, let's talk some odds and ends a couple leftover items from Atlanta and some other news floating around early in the week as we get ready to head to Vegas. Uh, the first thing we need to talk about, of course, is the glove. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about that glove. I'm talking about the glove Joey Logano wore in qualifying on Saturday. Now, if you notice, a lot of times when these guys are racing or when these guys are qualifying on the super speedways, you'll see them put their hand up to the, to the driver's side window to direct airflow in. And I guess it has some kind of aerodynamic advantage. I'm not an engineer, I don't know. But Saturday, Logano had a special glove on that had webbing in between the fingers. Of course, Fox caught this and we all saw it. Most importantly, NASCAR did. So what they, the way they penalized him for that was they, they, gave, they forced him to the back of the field to start the race Sunday uh, from his second second place starting position so it really didn't help him that much uh, and then they uh, they gave him a pass through uh, after the first for the first lap of the green flag fortunately for logano the the first caution of the day came out on that first lap because we had a huge crash um and i think it was like 16 cars were involved and that immediately brought out the yellow logano was able to work his way back to the field and i think by lap 70 he was in the top 10. He had, he, had a, he had a wreck late in the going that he made a mistake. Um, and so his race ended uh, with him in 28th place, I think. But it's still he still fought his way forward and had the speed and was doing well. Now, I don't know if that was an aerodynamic advantage or not. I'm sure, and I have a feeling that Penske probably took that to the uh, – probably took the – the, at some time, some point, had wind tunnel time and figured out that that would give them some kind of advantage. Obviously, it wasn't enough because he he started second, didn't win his second pole in a row. Uh, the, the 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 funny thing was the the uh, the front two spots were flipped from Daytona to um, Atlanta, where Logano was second and Michael McDowell was on pole. And the week before, of course, Logano had been on the pole at Daytona and McDowell was second. So anyway, Tuesday, come Tuesday, the NASCAR issued their penalty report, and they only fined Joey Logano $10,000 for the glove. 
which got the ire up of some people, but I also get it. It's a competitive, he had a competitive penalty at date at Atlanta. He was forced to lap down. He was forced to start at the rear of the field. And he also had to make a pass through. So I get it. $10,000 is about 10 bucks to you and me, but I, I, I see where they were coming from. And he pretty much said, uh, Joey, don't do it again. Now, yeah, Noah Gregson and Ryan Priest from Stuart Haas Racing, they did get some points taken away, 35 points, owner points, and driver points. They put some roof rails on that NASCAR confiscated during inspection, saying it gave them an aerodynamic, aerodynamic advantage. So again, they weren't penalized at the track. They were penalized this week, so they lost the, 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 the points there. So that's what happened with that. And finally... Jason Miller in the Xfinity Series, who's the crew chief for J.J. Yaley, I guess confronted Kyle Weatherman after the Xfinity race, and NASCAR saw that and suspended Jason Miller for two weeks. So I guess there was some pushing and shoving. I didn't see it, so I can't say what happened. Um, I did see a video of it. Didn't look all that bad, but in, bad enough that Jason Miller will be setting out the next two weeks. One final Atlanta note. Mark Garrow from PRN, uh, a, a great guy. And if you ever get a chance to listen to at the track to PRN, try to find their raw feed on your scanner. It, they're, they're so much fun to listen to. They're so insightful. Um, and they're, they're so knowledgeable about the sport. And that goes for Mark Garrow too. Well, anyway, after the race was over, um, he was down on the start finish line. Now, backstory. Trackhouse Racing has different things for their drivers in case they win a race. For Ross Chastain, it's a, it's a watermelon that he smashes, being a former, former watermelon farmer. And they change it out every couple of weeks because obviously watermelons don't last forever. For Daniel Suarez, they have a pinata that's shaped like a burrito, which is funny, funny. Um, his, last, his last win, though, was 56 races ago. So they had it filled with candy. So he, he busts the pinata at the start finish line. Mark Arrow's going down uh, back to the media center, which a lot of us do. We come down from the press box and go to the media center. Uh, saw some Hershey's on the ground and picked it up. Didn't think about it and was driving home that night back to North Carolina. Uh, opened it up in, in the dark and took a bite of the chocolate. And well, while they can change Ross Chastain's watermelons every few races, uh, they can't do that with a pinata. So I guess it's been 56 races since the candy and the pinata had had changed. So Mark got in. If you've ever had an old candy bar without knowing it, it's all white and chalky, and it's like it's it's like eating concrete. So I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, there was movement on the charters this week. We mentioned last week that um, that the team owners had hired uh, a legal team. Now comes news that their uh, NASCAR is going to offer the teams seven-year extensions, which will run them from 2025 to 20, uh, 2032, 2031, something like that. Um, but the owners still want them forever. But the point is, there was a little movement on them this week, and I think there's going to be more movement on them. Again, like I said, I think it's a little bit of posturing um, on both sides. And and they'll come to an agreement. Uh, everybody knows what happens when what happened when IndyCar split from CART several years ago. That's not going to happen, boys and girls. Um, there's 36 charters right now, and there's actually 40 charters, just for your bit of information. But NASCAR holds four of them back in case they get a new OEM, a new team that wants to buy one and get those guaranteed starting spot. One last one last note. NASCAR is also in discussion with Comcast for a new naming rights deal for the Xfinity series uh, that would start in 2025, which is the same year their Xfinity is going to move to the CW. Now, they could renew and we could have Xfinity for however many more years will happen, or we could see another name starting next season. If I hear anything on that, else on that, I'll let you know. For now, stay tuned on that. All right, so now let's look forward to this week and Vegas. Of course, you, Owen, you're going to have your preview up this week. So 
tell me and tell everybody else what you think about Vegas, what the what the strengths are going to be, and and what we're going to see at Vegas, and and most of all, who you think is going to win. Well, I think one team we have to look at, one group we have to look at is the Chevrolets. I know it's been two drafting tracks to start the year, but Chevrolet has a clean sweep, not just in the Cup Series, but in every series of NASCAR since since NASCAR started. Now, obviously, a Chevy or a Toyota won, sorry, at the Clash, but that's not an official points race. So every points race, Chevrolet has, has, has won. So it's going to be for the other manufacturers to come in and try to get a, get a win. I don't foresee that happening. My pick is William Byron for this weekend. He ran really well at Vegas last year, picked up, to w- picked up a win there, and I think he's going to do it again as those Chevys are fast. They're also the only cars that didn't change in the Cup Series, at least. They're the only manufacturer that didn't change their cars, and I think they've got some consistent speed while the Fords, the Toyotas probably have some things to iron out still. You know, that's not a bad bad pick. I think I think Byron, you know, obviously with his Daytona 500 win, which was huge. I think in Atlanta, he was strong until he got caught up in some things that weren't his own doing, so... You know, I tend to agree with you, but I also think that the Fords have shown some strength, um, maybe not during the race, but when it counted, you know, for polls and, and you know, with Logano and we don't, we, you and I were just talking, um, we don't know if you use the glove at Daytona and, and but if you, I'm sure that NASCAR and Fox have looked at that, but we'll, we're, you and I are going to do some sleuth and we'll see if we can see him <laughs> with the club, but but beyond that, uh, Logano did look good, um, at, at, you know, in Atlanta. He he moved up into the top ten after starting mm-hmm. from the back um, by lap 69, 70, I believe. Um, so you know he got caught up in a late race incident that he said. And they looked incredibly ball. strong at Daytona. Yeah, he did look incredibly strong at Daytona. He led the most laps there. So you know, well, I, I, that's my pick for this weekend. I think if he keeps going, if he keeps showing the strength like that, um, I think I think this could be his weekend to to do that. But you know, we'll see. Either way, I think if he keeps it up, he'll win. So you got Byron. I got Logano. The other thing to, to watch for this weekend, Eric Almirola will be making his Xfinity de- debut in the Joe Gibbs Racing Toyota. So we'll see that. Um, and then we got the truck race on Friday night. Owen, thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Head to the pub, lad. It's <laughs> it's nighttime over in London. It's It's 10 o'clock at night. So, um, but I'm incredibly proud of you. Keep up your great work. Keep up the work for a cup scene that you do. Your assignment, my friend, go to a pub, make them turn on a NASCAR race, and let's see what the reaction is from 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 the fans. So we'll see you. So thanks again. I'll get on it. There you go. Folks, thanks for tuning in. We appreciate it. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks for joining us. Yeah! We'll see you. Thanks for listening to Speed Talk Live. For questions or just to tell us how bad our production is or to leave other feedback, leave us a comment below. For all the latest NASCAR news, visit www.cupscene.com. Until next time, peace out and let's go racing.